Right at seven, okay. Hi everyone, welcome to Highlights from DDW, Patient-Centered Management of Ulcerative Colitis, Urgent Patient Need. I'm Jennifer Bomberger, the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Medscape Education, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator for tonight's program. Medscape is thrilled to be partnering with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation to share highlights from our co-developed program, Patient-Centered Management of Ulcerative Colitis. This program was presented to the gastroenterologists from around the world that attended DDW in May. As we begin, may I take a moment to recognize Lily for their support of this program through an independent educational grant. Thank you, Lily. Our goal tonight is to provide highlights and insights from the program and address critical questions on urgency and IBD in the patient population specifically. That's why we're talking to you. Um, I want to welcome tonight's presenters. Um, first off, we have Dr. Russ Cohen. He has an extensive resume that I am not going to read through right now, um, but effectively works at the Pritzker School of Medicine at University of Chicago and Codorex, like a million different things. Um, even as so cool, he's an active member of Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Healthcare Professional Engagement Committee. And you can find him on Twitter, Dr. Russell Cohen at UChicago Med. And little tidbit, he has bus stop ads and billboards around Chicago. So he's very, very, very cool. Um, and then our favorite, Amy Baguadia. Um, Amy is a patient advocate who has worked and served on the Crohn's and Colitis National Council of College Leaders, now provides insight as a member of the foundation's patient ad advisory task force. Sorry, stuttering through that one. Amy is an incoming MD candidate at Stanford School of Medicine in Palo Alto. And you can also find Amy on Twitter at Amy Buguadia. Thank you both for joining today. Dr. Cohen, any comments? Yes, I'm actually not on Twitter. So whoever that Dr. person is on Twitter, it's not me. It's not Dr. Russ Cohen. Forget so Twitter. <laughs> they may send wonderful things to that person. I, I hope that uh, he has a lovely time with all the Twitter uh, tweets that he has no idea what they're about. Um, but luckily, um, uh, I am getting the opportunity to work here with Amy, who's fantastic, and Jen and the whole group. And um, we're really happy that you're tuning in because I guarantee you this is going to be educational and entertaining. We hope so. <laughs> oh, we're, we're counting on your rest. We'll, it'll happen. Amy, anything to say welcome? Any intro comments? Yeah, I'm just incredibly happy to be here. I know that urgency in, in colitis is um, sometimes a very uncomfortable topic, but it must be talked about. Um, I think it's so important when it comes to kind of the whole patient um, experience. So whether you're a patient or a caregiver or a clinician, I'm just really excited that you're here and we're excited to jump right into it. Thank you so much. So before we jump into it, I just have a few quick housekeeping items. Um, the information provided during tonight's chat is only meant for educational purposes. It should not replace any advice you receive from your gastroenterologist, primary care provider, nutritionist, surgeon, or any other medical professional. If you have questions about your specific care, please reach out to your healthcare providers. If you have any questions about IBD, unrelated to ulcerative colitis, patient-centered management and urgency. Uh, we won't be able to talk about them tonight, but you're encouraged to contact the IBD Help Center by calling 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN or emailing info at Crohn's and Crohn's Colitis Foundation.org, no and in there, to discuss any other questions, receive support, resources, support your IBD care and engage with your medical team. In reviewing the program presented at DDW, there were tons of insights um, that we'd like to discuss with Dr. Cohen and Amy, and I'm going to hand it over the, to them to start question and answering. Ready, guys? Thank you so much. Well, first, the first question is, um, I don't, who is the other Dr. Russell Cohen? <laughs> we have no idea. Are you trying to look up right now? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, DDW is Digestive Diseases Week, which is an international meeting from the American 
Gastroenterological Association. That's why we call it DDW. It's too hard to say American Gastroenterological Association. And uh, it's a worldwide meeting. Uh, it happened to be in San Diego. And next year it's going to be here in Chicago. And um, it brings part expert, experts around the world. And one of the wonderful things that uh, this Medscape Symposium that uh, Lily um, supported was that we had um, a bunch of experts, uh, including myself, as well as a patient advocate, Amy. And uh, we were able to provide a lot of guidance to um, people understanding what are the true issues that uh, impact patients with ulcerative colitis. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, urgency it can be used as a lot of words, but in, um, in our world, urgency means I have to go to the washroom for a bowel movement right now, as in get out of my way. I don't care if someone else is, <laughs> is in the other stall, Hopefully there are more than one stalls, but otherwise I want to be sitting in your lap. I'm coming in there right now. And um, that's sometimes overlooked um, when we look at, you go to see the doctor, they say, well, how are you feeling? Oh, okay, you're still having diarrhea. Well, not as much. Are you having blood in your stool? No, are you having pain? No, but in real, real life, the problem is that you can't go to work or to school or you're afraid that every time you step out of the house, you're gonna to need to look on your phone and find where the nearest, nearest bathroom is. So trying to address that, understanding that the patient's quality of life isn't just what doctors ask about, but actually about things such as urgency is, is the key. Amy, how did I do? A plus. <laughs> I think that ulcerative colitis, um, as Dr. Cohen mentioned, um, has such a huge plethora of symptoms. And um, we talk a lot, I know, this idea of like, yes, let's destigmatize um, inflammatory bowel disease. Let's talk about it as more than just a bathroom disease because it is, right? It affects so much from our mental health um, to our physical health, to our joint pain, et cetera, that some patients experience. But the fact of the matter is sometimes myself as a patient, I get so focused on these other, what we call extra intestinal manifestations of the disease, right? So things that are not just in our gut, um, but elsewhere in our bodies that I sometimes fail to mention to my doctor, I am experiencing gut pain and I am experiencing issues when it comes to the bathroom, particularly, right? Like when I'm out and about, um, or when I was, you know, attending college and graduate school to always being in fear of where is my classroom going to be located? Where is my dorm going to be located? Is there going to be a bathroom close by? Um, so there are, you know, very important considerations, including those when we talk about really how to manage um, ulcerative colitis in everyday life. Absolutely. And um, I, there's a resource on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's page for bathroom locator uh, that I really encourage um, everyone to um, uh, be aware of and access um, and hopefully um, also be able to improve the awareness of other people about it, too. You know, um, it's interesting um, that when uh, patients um, see us and, and tell things to us, it, it always turns out that they tell our nurses more than what they tell us, okay? I think it's that they don't wanna displease the doctor. So, um, and maybe it's a teaching from their grandmother who told them, make sure you wear clean underwear and, and, and dress nice when you see the doctor. Um, but what really the, the information I find out a lot is from the, the nurse or medical assistant who was in the room beforehand or sometimes even after when I step out and then they come up to me and they say, the patient burst into tears after you left. And, and, and I say, oh, usually people burst into tears when I walk into the room, but nevertheless, <laughs> because it turns out that they were this close to saying to me, but they, they were intimidated or afraid or whatever it may be. So, so Amy, what would you recommend to patients um, when they are in going into a medical system, particularly if they're feeling a little intimidated or embarrassed to talk about their real issues? Absolutely, that's such a great question. I would first say your emotions are valid. Um, I think a lot of the times living with a, with a chronic disease such as ulcerative colitis can be scary. Um, it can be really overwhelming. Um, and I think in our society, you know, as, as much progress as we've made to kind of destigmatize the disease, there is, you know, a lot of hesitancy or shame that we still might be experiencing and that's okay. Um, but then the question is, 
who do we have in our support system in order to really help us overcome um, those feelings? And I think it's it's quite common to just kind of sometimes look at a doctor and be like, oh, well, they're just asking specifically like, oh, how are your bowel movements doing? And, you know, oh, they don't care about me. And that's simply not true. Um, so I think just thinking about your clinical care team, viewing them, you know, the nurses, the the practitioners, and also your gastroenterologist as someone who's not going to judge you. They went to school for so many years just to learn how to support people just like you. And so I think recognizing that, that they're a key part of your clinical care team and that they care about you as a person, not just you as someone who has this disease, um, I think can be an important mindset shift because then you start thinking and, and sharing all of those activities of daily living and how you're doing as a whole person because IBD can affect so much. But, and, and you know, there is help available, but only if you know how to articulate and ask for it. I think that's really the key. No one else knows your story and your disease better than you. Um, but then to figure out how to effectively communicate that to the people who can help you is a huge skill, something that I'm definitely practicing as well. Um, so really figuring out like who is that trusted person in your clinical care team? Um, how can you seek out a doctor and a nurse that you can trust is really important. And then working on building that long-term relationship with them, because it's not like, you know, you just see them once and it's done. This is a chronic disease that you will be managing. So it's important to kind of share all of those things, the good and the bad, even if you feel uncomfortable at first, recognizing that it's an important step is sharing so that we can then get you the care that you need. Absolutely. I think that's a fantastic summary. And, you know, be aware that you may actually meet various members of the medical team. So, for example, I'm at the University of Chicago. So in addition to the physicians, we have very experienced advanced practice nurses or nurse practitioners. Um, uh, some other sites have physician assistants, PAs, and many of them uh, over time uh, get very well trained and are particularly approachable um, by the patients about some, some of these issues too. We also do extensive training of our own nurses. Um, we have dietitians uh, and many questions for what can I eat? How can I eat? What could I do? And then even a GI psychologist um, to help coping with, you know, your entire Zen um, and how to maybe help control some of the uncertainties that you may have um, perhaps related to your, your GI disease. I mean, Amy, do you find that these are helpful resources to you? Absolutely. I, I find myself sometimes thinking about this idea of I only have a 20 minute appointment, but I have six months of my life to, you know, summarize and, and try to pare down. And so when I'm preparing for these medical appointments, um, I recognize I try to write down everything that I want to talk about with my clinical care team. And as Dr. Cohen mentioned, it's not just my, my lovely GI, but it's also the nurse practitioner that's there and available. Um, sometimes if I have more mental health concerns that I want to talk about, um, I will bring those up and then ask for a referral to a psychologist or to a gastropsychologist if there's someone who specializes in, in IBD or chronic illness. And that can be just really important to share, you know, hey, these are all of my concerns. Um, I want to talk about some of them with you, but I was also wondering if I could get some more guidance on, let's say, diet. So that way you're, you, you will get the referral that you need, even if you're not. I know that I have the privilege of being treated at a large university um, academic medical center that has all of those wonderful resources that Dr. Cohen mentioned. Um, but maybe in your area, you don't have access right away in that clinic to those specialists. That's okay too. Bringing this up with your doctor and then figuring out how to get referred to those places can be helpful. And I know the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's website also has a way that you can search up um, for specifically IBD practitioners that can help you. Absolutely. You know, um, <laughs> One of the questions I always ask my patients with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, when they're coming back after being treated, hopefully successfully, uh, is I say, oh, how are you? Nice to meet you, this and that too. Nice to see you again. And then when we got to start talking about their GI condition, I say, so um, are you better? And they say, oh yeah, I'm better. You're, you're a great doctor. And I'm like, oh, please. And then I say, 
are you perfect? And everyone stops. They're like, what, what do you mean perfect? I'm like, well, are you perfect? So the people who say, well, how can I be perfect? I have ulcerative colitis, or how can I be perfect? I have Crohn's disease. No, many times you can be perfect. There actually are um, approaches to treat patients with Crohn's and colitis that many, not all, but many patients can go back to quote unquote normal life. Um, and uh, one of the things that's important is you shouldn't expect not to be perfect. Now, being quite frank with you, we can't get everybody there. But um, if you have the expectation that I want to get back to perfection or where I was or as close as possible, that actually helps us too. So for example, if I were to say to a patient, oh, oh well, you were, um, you know, how are you doing as your diarrhea? They're like, it's great because they were going 15 times a day and now they're only going eight times a day. So I write in my notes, oh, patient's doing great, but they're still going to the bathroom eight times a day. Uh, but heck it's, heck, it's a lot better than 15, and maybe they're not having pain anymore and this and that too. Um, and, and what I'm getting to is that unlike many, many years ago, and, and unfortunately I was practicing GI then, we really only had steroids and some other um, uh, mild medicines to work with before the biologics and novel small molecules started. And we had to really balance, well, how much steroids could we give you because so many side effects and maybe we'll be willing to accept partially better as, as good enough. But that's, that's 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Nowadays, we have an expanded number of therapies to treat patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease that are very, very safe and effective. And don't be in the mindset that, oh, I got so much better um, here. We really want to be able to push you to the point where things are normal or as normal as they could possibly be. So Amy, um, when you've had problems with your bowels, I always say to the patients, would you go out on a boat in Lake Michigan? And they say, what are you crazy? How can I go on a boat in Lake Michigan? And then when I get them to the point of being perfect, I said, when you go on a boat in Lake Michigan, they say, I will go on a boat in Lake Michigan. And then I say, can you invite me to go along because I don't happen to know how to boat. <laughs> As you know, they say that the second happiest day of your life is the day you buy your boat. But nevertheless, um, so I mean, what I mean, do you think what I was saying is that mumbo jumbo or is there, there really reality to it? I, I love the way you phrase that, this idea of, of picking, like not settling almost, right? Because I think when we've been sick for so long, I a thousand percent have fallen into this before where I have been in an awful flare and, you know, I get, I get better ish from where I was, um, still not, you know, perfect, still not, you know, up there ready to go on a boat, but you know, I'm getting better. And so then when I go and talk to my GI, oftentimes I do fall into that trap of saying like, oh yeah, I'm good. Like I, you know, because I feel like I have to be grateful for, for that like little jump and improvement. But I think what I've realized, especially as you were talking, I think what you're getting at is this idea of it's good and important to be grateful and share those successes and improvements, but that doesn't mean we have to settle and just end there. Like that endpoint can continue to grow and increase. Um, and so recognize and setting those goals and then sharing them with your provider is key, right? So saying and picking that one thing, whether it's, you know, hey, I'm going off to college next year and I will be living, let's say in a dorm with a communal restroom and I want to live in my dorm, and not be in fear of having an accident. Let's say that's your goal. And you communicate that effectively to your practitioner, right? To your GI. And that's when they can really start measuring and fitting in this idea of your lifestyle and your symptomatic goals and, and how to get you there. Um, so I think instead of, you know, it is important, of course, um, to celebrate those victories when a treatment is working, um, not giving up hope. I know so many of these therapies, they do take a while and I get impatient sometimes too, but recognizing, hey, I'm better than I was yesterday, but tomorrow I can still be even better. So kind of a good balance between that goal setting, gratefulness and, and hope. Well, that's terrific. And you know, one of the things that you brought up is actually translating into now how we do our clinical trials and approach to clinical care. 
And that is we take, first of all, our traditional things, colonoscopy or CAT scan or whatever it may be, um, add to that now, well, maybe when we do the scan or the colonoscopy, whether things are really normal from what we can see, add to that, well, how about when we look under the microscope at the biopsies, are those normal? But then also add in what the patient's saying. You know, I gave the example, I can maybe invent after this, this, this Facebook Live, I can invent the best medicine in the world for Crohn's and colitis. Um, however, it can, may have horrible side effects and so no one will ever take it. So there I maybe healed the disease, but it's, it's unbearable. So that wouldn't work. So you kind of have to work it out so that you're meeting both. In other words, I'm happy when I look with the scope or scan. The pathologist is happy when she or he looks under the microscope and the patient is happy and the therapies are safe. And we have many of those, um, many of those right now. Um, you know, one of the things that we look for is the lining of the bowel. So particularly in ulcerative colitis, where the only the part of it that's inflamed is the, the lining of the bowel that the bowel movement is through. So when we look with the colonoscope or colonoscopy, that's what we see. You know, if we, we can heal that, get rid of all the ulcers. Um, and uh, we can do that safely now and effectively in most patients or many patients, it depends on how sick they are. And we couldn't do that in the past too. So Amy, you come out of a colonoscopy and you wake up and maybe uh, not a little foggy, but then like what type of information that, the, that your doctor says, well, it looks better. Is that helpful? Or do you want to know, is it healed? Great question. And I think I, as someone who's diagnosed at age 10, so like 14-ish years ago now, my idea and conceptualization of like what it means to be better, I think that as, as you said, right, we've had so many scientific advances since then. And I myself have grown from a pediatric to an adult patient. And I think back then when I was, you know, going into these colonoscopies, all I really understood about my IBD was that okay, there are these bleeding ulcers in my colon. So if I could just see a picture and it looked like less red, like, woohoo, I've won, <laughs> you know? And that was kind of the concept. Then afterwards, I started realizing that there are so many different types of remission, right? This idea of like, I, I just want to be feeling good. That's number one, right? Um, clinical remission. This idea of like all of the symptoms, those goals we talked about are being met. That's really important. But then when that happens, I always ask, hey, like I do, you know, it's been about a year. It's been about two years. I need to get a colonoscopy done to see whether how I'm feeling out here matches what's going on in there. And kind of the reason that I know now that that's important is because when you see, when I've talked to my doctors about clinical treatment goals and plans, they've actually explained to me the research that, that shows exactly why, like, okay, hey, the inflammation in your colon, even if you're not experiencing symptoms, that's not necessarily ideal, right? We want to take that inflammation away. And so once I realized, okay, the goal of my treatment is to obviously have me feeling great, but to have my colon looking great, and this is why that's really, I think the key part of it, because I think sometimes, like you said, right, like certain doctors might have certain goals of like, oh, this needs to look good. But like, why? Like, why is it even important for me to not have inflammation if I'm not feeling it? And I think that's the key part for providers, um, you know, to communicate to their patients, but for patients to also ask and say, hey, I noticed you said that I need to have a colonoscopy so you can check it out what are you looking for and why are you looking for it can be like a really helpful, you know, conversation to have just so you understand all of the different endpoints um, and goals for everyone in your, in your care team. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we do now is we have evidence that let's say in ulcerative colitis and somewhat in Crohn's, if I look in with a scope and it's normal, no more ulcers, no more inflammation. And let's say it's January 1st. What a, what a great New Year's uh, Day celebration, meeting me the first day of the year and having a colonoscopy. Yes, I know. Yeah, there we go. Good thumbs up there. So um, that if it's healed, the likelihood over that whole year of you avoiding going into the hospital, going to surgery, ending up on 
steroids or prednisone type medicines, which we try to avoid, um, is greatly reduced. And there is growing evidence, some from our institution and, and some from others, that your colon cancer risk may be decreased. So patients who have ulcerative colitis, which is the colon, that's why it's colitis, or Crohn's disease of the colon, or uh, they are actually over time at a higher risk for colon cancer. And it's interesting because when patients come to see us in the office and we talk about being on a new medicine, they're like, well, I saw a commercial, I read, read this thing, and it talks about lymphoma and all these things too. The risk of getting cancer from any of our medicines is minuscule, okay? Minuscule. Uh, the risk of, getting, of, of ending up having colon cancer with longstanding ulcerative colitis or Crohn's of the colon is not minuscule. So you start saying, if you want to avoid cancer, which who doesn't want to avoid cancer? Instead of being afraid of what you see on TV or read, let's look at reality. Your mo most common cancer risk is, ulcer is, is colon cancer. So it makes much more sense to try to decrease that risk rather than worry about very, very rare cancers, usually not even related to the medicines, it's just that they're mentioned in the TV commercials because they have to, uh, and run your life being worried about something you're never gonna get, while you could have prevented something that you might get. And you know it's a whole different mindset. You really want the lining of your bowel to be normal as far as we know, and that's called mucosal healing. So some of the endpoints in our clinical trials and uh, is that the lining of the bowel mucosa is normal, particularly in ulcerative colitis. Uh, and that's something that when we look with a scope, and this is, I guess, is the, my international sign for doing a scope. <laughs> we look with a scope. Um, if it's not healed up, even if you feel great, we might say to you, know, we know you feel great, but we should increase the dose of the medicine, add another medicine, change to a different therapy, um, whatever it may be, because we really want to try to heal the lining of the bowel without using steroids um, and to keep you well long term. I mean, uh, you know, and, and how, what, how does that feel? You feel great going to your scope and then the doctor says, well, you know, there's still stuff going on. We want you to change things up. Right? Is that nervous for you? Is that concerning? Absolutely. Even though it's been 14 years, every time I go in, you know, for yet another scope, I... I, you know, I have the prep down to a science, you know, but when it comes to the actual, when I'm ready to wake up, you know, waking up and the first thing I ask, I'm like, so how did it look? You know, can I see the pictures? And they're like, calm down. Um, and I'm like, no, no, I'm a little nervous. Like I want to see, I want to know if it looks as good as I feel. And, you know, because I know that exactly what you were saying, because risk reduction is so important. Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm reducing the risk of a flare. I'm reducing the risk of surgery, of colorectal cancer, all of these other things that I know I could very well be facing at some point, right? So if I can, I want to do everything in my power to reduce that. Um, so that's, you know, my number one goal as a patient. That being said, I do recognize I still do get scared or nervous because I'm like, no, I'm so happy on my, you know, oral therapy. Like, why do I need to switch to an injection? Or, you know, I'm happy with my home injections. Why do I have to now go in for an infusion when I've been, you know, in a really good routine? But recognizing like that there are slight compromises and adjustments that we have to make um, that can most certainly change up your routine. But I put that in perspective by saying, what would mess with my routine even more is having a flare or <laughs> developing colorectal cancer or all of these other, or surgery or all of these other things. Um, and so kind of trying to put it in perspective that way, almost like a risk benefit sort of analysis can be useful. And what's also really helped me, to be honest, is sharing with my provider, like, hey, I'm, I'm excited to like see the pictures and like to figure out like what the pathology report says. But I'm also a little nervous because I'm happy with where I am in terms of treatment goals. Um, and so those two things can be true at the same time. Um, and it can be helpful to just practice sharing that with your clinical care team, but also with your support system at home. Um, for me, it's my parents. They're like a huge um, anchor um, of support for me. And I talk through a lot of these things with them. 
Um, and they help me feel a lot better, you know, when it comes to, hey, after your scope, like, let me give you your favorite food or let me cheer you up a little bit. And they know that that's something that I also need to help treat me as a, as a whole human as we're trying to think about and weigh all of these things. Hey, you, you know, it's interesting. So many years ago, we've had biological therapies on, on the market since 1998. Um, and these new therapies came on and all of a sudden I started getting phone calls, although the phones didn't look like that back then. I have an old phone over here somewhere. I can probably used to get phone calls um, from the uh, pathologist and the pathologist would say, hey, um, are you sure this patient ever had ulcerative colitis? I, I see everything's completely healed up. I've never seen that before. And we even went back to the 1950s and looked at the old biopsies from years ago and proved, yeah, the patient really had ulcerative colitis or Crohn's and now it's gone. And, and as, as you know, as a doctor, as a specialist, I mean, even as maybe someone not involved, that's amazing that all of a sudden without steroids, you can give people therapies that the disease disappears. Um, and that actually, when we don't see it with our eyes and we don't see it under the microscope, that's called deep remission. And people in deep remission, they stay, they're the most likely to stay well. However, you have to generally stay on therapy to, to stay well. And that's another misunderstanding. People say, well, you know, uh, I don't want to start this because then I'm going to be on my whole life. Okay. Well, let okay, guys look at Amy. Amy's wonderful. Amy's going to medical school in the fall in Stanford. She is going to be one of our top leading doctors in the world. She may find the cure for X, Y, Z. Um, she may not be very happy during medical school. <laughs> you should do this next six months and see if you're smiling. But nevertheless, the point is, is that new advances are made all the time. There's no way that I or anybody else can be telling you you're going to have to be on therapy the rest of your life. All we can say is, you know, right now, as of now, the best data suggests that if you are in this deep remission or, you know, remission with your therapies, we, you do stay on them because the likelihood of you relapsing off the therapy is high and sometimes it doesn't work again. The only therapies we don't do that with are steroids. If you're on steroids, even budesonide, we try to get you onto a non-steroid agent to keep you well. And don't get hung up on, well, I'm going to be on my whole life. You know, if it turns out that you are on it your whole life and you're healthy, isn't that better than being sick your whole life? Um, and you may not be on it your whole life. So don't get stuck on those things. Don't get stuck on commercials that direct to consumer marketing. Point is that there are ways for you to get better. And now we have therapies that even under the microscope, um, we see things healed up or nearly healed up, which is really quite remarkable. So Amy, you're going to um, go to medical school, you're going to go to Stanford, and um, they're going to tell you that um, you know, that, that you, you have to, people with Crohn's or colitis, they never, they never get better. They never get, get cured. Is that true? What do you think? That will be the point in the lecture. I raise my hand and say, no, no, <laughs> because we do. You're, you're absolutely right, Dr. Cohen. There are, you know, I um, have had periods in my life where I've been in what's called deep, a deep tissue remission. And that was so exciting to me. I like cried. I was like, this is amazing, like, woohoo, you know, and I stayed there for a very long time, um, which, which gave me kind of the best quality of life, um, and when it came time that that was no longer true, um, that was okay, too, because I recognized, I was like, okay, like, therapies have gotten me there before, different meds can get me there now, you know, so, so recognizing and kind of trusting that process, um, was useful. And now that I am feeling a lot better, I know I still have to be taking my injections. I have to be taking my regular oral medications. And I'm going to continue that because in my mind, it's kind of like, if it's not broken, why fix it? <laughs> you know? And, and if, if I, if these therapies have helped me get into my deep tissue remission, or, or in my case, currently it's just clinical remission. Um, but that's a huge step forward um, and exciting. Um, and so I think also as patients, I recognize it can be scary or frustrating, particularly I think for the young adults out there, for everyone, but young adults who see, you know, oh, none of my friends have to take injections. None of my friends have to take, you know, these daily pills. Um, 
I get it. Um, but I think thinking about all of the things you can do with your friends, because these medications are kind of keeping you, um, doing well or whatever, you know, therapy or course of treatment that you and your, your GI have worked together to come up with, I think can be really, you know, important to keep reminding yourself of, um, recognizing how many of the amazing possibilities and doors, uh, this has opened up for you can really be key. I think mental health wise, when you're thinking about, you know, where you started when it comes to those 18 trips to the bathroom or, you know, the incredible, terrifying moment where you realize I need to go and there's no restroom. There's no fear like it. Right. And so if I could never have another day in my life where I feel that fear, I, I would give anything for it. Right. And that's exactly why I feel so specific about staying on these treatment regimens and being really careful, um, listening my, to my GI, getting those regular colonoscopies, um, because I remember where I started <laughs> and I don't want to go backwards to that. Um, and so taking advantage of the science and the, and the improvements in care is something that really like helps me keep my eyes on the path forward. You know, Amy, every time you said the word injections, I wonder, do people shudder in the audience? That sounds serious. IV injections. Is that, is, is that more serious medicine than pills? What do you think? Yeah, say good question. I definitely, I remember I just, I started my injection therapy about two years ago now. And I remember I was like, whoa, this is a big jump. This, you know, um, because just for me, I was like, I'm used to popping like a handful of pills every single day. And now you're telling me I only need to take one of those pills daily and then take an injection. Huh? Weird. <laughs> you know, and it was, it was scary. It was one of those things. Um, I recently attended, um, Camp Oasis as a counselor um, through, you know, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And I was talking actually to a lot of my campers who had to take injections during camp. So I would walk them over to the med shed and our lovely peds GIs and nurses would help them do their injections. And I was talking to them about it. And I was like, hey, how do you feel about your injections? Like, do you do it yourself? Do you, you know, um, and depending on the age, right? Like I personally have the 13 to 15 year olds and they're kind of at that age where, yeah, their parents help them, but some, some of them, you know, are excited to, to try it themselves. And, and it's cool to talk to all these other patients and recognize, yes, injections can be, I recognize a very scary thing, particularly when you're younger, or, you know, I think sometimes TV doesn't do a great job of like <laughs> taking away that like needle phobia. It looks very scary. Um, my, I guess what's helped me is, is just getting into like a regular routine when it comes to on my injection night, like I will turn on my favorite show. I'll have a little band-aid ready. I just told my mom yesterday that I should go buy some like fun band-aids, um, you know, as a little like sticker reward, like me, a 24 year old woman. I think, you know, that's a fun little reward for myself um, at the end of that induction day and kind of getting into that routine, whether you're doing injections or infusions or even just taking some pills that you're tired of taking, you know, Let's say instead of, you know, water, check with your doctor, of course, but you, you know, if you like peach juice, for example, and you want to be drinking peach juice as you're like taking your, your pills, why not? Right. Um, as long as you're getting hydrated, you're drinking something you want to drink, as long as it's approved by your doctor, it's okay. <laughs> you know, and those types of things I think can be helpful. And then also connecting with people from, you know, the IBD or just generally at large, the chronic illness community can be really useful um, because you'll find so many of us that have the same routine. I actually have a good friend of mine um, who also has IBD and the two of us like used to FaceTime for the longest time as we were taking our injections like together. So it was like a little buddy, you know, system that we would do, um, even though our injections weren't on the same day or at the same time when it was time for mine, I would call her when it was time for hers, she would call me. And that was just a fun little, then I started associating, oh my goodness, I get to talk to my friend instead of being like, oh no, I get to stab myself with this needle now. <laughs> so it's just the little things, you know, that can be really useful when we start thinking about things that might be, you know, rightfully scary, but how can we recognize, yes, I need to add this to my routine, but that doesn't mean I can't add all of these fun extra supports <laughs> when it comes to that. 
Maybe you should consider peach schnapps instead of peach juice. That could really liven things up. So welcome to my world. So only if um, approved by your doctor. What's that? Only if approved by your doctor. I'm a doctor. I approve. Okay, I'll approve it for you. <laughs> so you know, um, you throw out a lot of things out there. Um, just for those who don't know, Camp Oasis is a wonderful um, uh, part of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. If you just Go Google the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. You can find out more about Camp Oasis uh, opportunities. I strongly encourage if you have children who have Crohn's and Colitis, they really come out of their shell. They're with people just like them. And then they end up being the counselors or the leaders as they grow as older kids too, and really um, serve as mentors to the younger kids too. So it's just all around fantastic. So, you know, before we had the uh, biologics, the medicines, for the most part, we used were pills. There were lots of pills, as you mentioned, handful of pills, 12 pills a day, 16 pills every day. And then um, what happens is that people do feel that, oh, I'm doing a big step up when I go to an IV drug, that's called infusible or an injectable. But in reality, the biological therapies they have to be given right now IV or shot because if you took them as a pill, you would just digest it. They're actually very clean medicines. And what I mean by that is that um, they generally just knock down inflammation through different pathways. That's why there's different options, but they very rarely affect other organs of the body. So unless you're having a, an allergic type of reaction, um, would be pretty rare. Um, you generally have no side effects and um, they don't have just any food you take by mouth or pills has to first be processed through the liver and that can affect how other medicines are taken. They don't have that thing. They go right into your, your system too. So um, they're actually a lot cleaner and safer than the, some of the older pills that we always relied on for patients with Crohn's and colitis, which we still use those pills. Um, they're actually based on old chemotherapy or organ transplant rejection drugs. We do have to give them to some people. But even though those are pills, in many cases, for many patients, the medicines that are given IV or shot are safer than the pills. They're more effective than the pills. And they're also uh, FDA approved for Crohn's and colitis, where the, uh, the older type of pills um, in those classes, the immunosuppressants actually aren't. We just stole them from other, other um, uh, practices too. So don't be turned off by the idea that, oh, I have to take an IV or shot. It's the state of the technology, it's modern technology. The pills, I mean, the old pills, some of you may be on sulfasalazine, that was invented in 1940. It was actually invented by a, a female rheumatologist, Dr. Nana Schwartz of the Karolinska Institute. She was wanted to create a medicine for rheumatoid arthritis, and she created sulfasalazine. And many of mesalamine, valsalazide, olsalazine, those pills for ulcerative colitis, they're all from 1940s technology. So we have many new therapies that are very safe and effective. And yes, right now, most are IEDs or shots. There are some newer pills that are now percolating into the, into the world. But look at your TV ads. You're seeing now patients who have ectopic dermatitis or eosinophilic esophagitis or other things, they're putting put on biologics because they work well, they're clean, they rarely have any safety issues, and they're actually a lot safer than some of the other medicines, certainly safer than steroids. Um, just so you know, we just recently had the first approved therapy that has an on-body injector, so you're actually not giving yourself an injection. Um, and you just put this thing on and then it takes care of the business for you over the 10 minutes or so too. So um, we're, we're getting there. Um, we're getting there. So don't fear IV or shot medicines. They actually are usually the best option that we have for most patients with Crohn's or colitis, although there are some new pills that are recently been um, released that also are very good medicines as well. All right. Okay. Before you keep going, I just want to give you like a little time warning. We've got a little, a little around 15 minutes, a little less than 15 minutes. So this is probably going to be your last or second to last question. Just let me know. Oh, do you have a question for us? No. Oh, oh. Okay. Topic that you talk about. How are we doing so far? We do like. I'm, I'm entertained and oh, educated. 
many new things. Yes. I actually am going to go talk to one of my doctors. So I think this is good information for anyone with any sort of chronic disease, on, honestly. Okay. So uh, I'm handing it back to you, Russ. <laughs> oh, you can always hand it back to me. Or Amy, either. <laughs> well, how about this, Amy? You're going. You're going to be going to Stanford Medical School, one of the hardest medical schools to get into. Congratulations. That means that I didn't even get an interview at Stanford Medical School. <laughs> so, moving on. So, Amy, you have the opportunity to invent a new therapy to treat Crohn's and colitis. What would that therapy look like? That is an excellent question. I, I think, I know we just talked about injections not being, you know, being scary to some folks. Um, but I think about it and honestly, I'm like very happy with my little injection routine that I have going now. And I think like delivery method, obviously of drugs can so differ depending on, you know, what exactly it's targeting, how it's working, that sort of thing. Um, but one little shot every two weeks um, that doesn't hurt and that can give me, you know, a little, little fun routine um, is not bad. So to be honest, I mean, yes, I definitely like, I think that patients going into the clinical space, going into research is so important because we've been there and we know, right? So can think about the like end user perspective as well. Um, and I think that's true when it comes to developing drugs. It's true when it comes to different, I guess, scales that we use to assess patients when it comes to clinical training and the language that we use um, to talk to providers. Um, and so, yeah, I see definitely great advances. I don't know if this is directly answering your question, but it is, I all to say is I appreciate that you're asking because I think it is kind of a cool opportunity um, that we as, you know, folks who have chronic illnesses can also go into these fields and can make a difference and really be, um, be the ones developing these drugs, be the ones um, also then taking said medication to keep us healthy, to keep us, you know, then being able to go off and invent more medications. And then the cycle continues, the world goes round. <laughs> Right. So one of the, the um, things that I uh, like when I see patients, I have trainees often, um, you know, that way they can like, you know, prop me up if I start slumping over or slap me awake, things like that. Um, I said, to them, well, what therapy do you think they're going to choose? Because in reality, when we talk to patients, many, not all patients have an option now. And you say, I say to them, well, do you want to take a pill maybe once a day or twice a day, every day, or as you mentioned, a shot every two weeks or in three IVs and then an IV every two months or one IV and a shot every two months or three IVs and a shot every few months. I mean, there's, there's a variety. And believe it or not, um, I almost always predict wrong um, because you would think people may be saying, well, I don't really want to take a shot. Well, you know, taking a pill every day or twice a day, you know, every day. It also reminds you every time you take, oh, I'm, uh, I'm taking, I got colitis, I got Crohn's, whatever, as opposed to, hey, I'm, I'm living, you know, fancy and free. And then every couple of months, I just go to the infusion center and I get an idea. I like the fact that I have a medical professional doing it because I can't trust myself to give that stuff. Or... No, I travel, I do stuff. I just want to tell, you know, the shots are generally painless now. And um, there may even be ones that don't even give yourself a shot because we're coming out now too. I just want to do that. Um, so it's funny because you might be surprised what people tell you. And that's one of the education that you'll get as you're going through medical school and, and, and through your career too. Don't presume what the patient wants. Ask them what they want. Do you think that's a good idea? I think it's an excellent idea. Um, and just to reiterate too, definitely, I think I am literally just one of millions of patients, right? And so some of you might be watching and you're like, what is she saying? Like these injections, I could, you know, could never be me. And that's okay. I respect your feelings are valid. Your, your life experiences as a patient are, are just as valid. Um, I think that we are talking about specific experiences that some people might resonate with, some people might not, and that's okay too. 
Um, but I think that really just reemphasizes the point we were talking about earlier about sharing your specific goals with your clinical care team, because they may not know, right? They may be seeing all of these, you know, patients who all happen to prefer a particular therapy. But just as, as Dr. Cohen said, that's probably not likely, right? Everyone, you know, experiences things differently. Some people like traveling, other people, maybe they just don't trust themselves to remember to take a pill every day, like definitely have friends there in that camp and that's okay, <laughs> you know? Um, let's make sure that they are going to be able to adhere to a treatment plan by giving them something like a regular appointment to get an infusion every two months. Or maybe if you're a college student, right, like maybe that just won't work with your uh, schedule. Maybe you have to go reach out to disability services at your college to get the, you know, those resources. Um, or maybe it's just easier, you know, in your case, you don't live too close to a particular hospital that can give you that. You have to think about travel time and all of that stuff too. Um, and, and that's a valid and important part of your disease experience too. So when it comes to talking about goals, it's not just, yes, I want to be in deep tissue remission, or yes, I want to only have to go to the bathroom one day, you know, once a day and, and, and get to walk there instead of run. Like those are all really important goals, but other goals could be, I want to be on a type of medication that I can actually fit well into my lifestyle. Or I want to make sure, you know, to be honest, I keep forgetting to take this pill. I, I you know, I want to be better about it. How can I do that? Um, and, and those are the types of things I think that are also just as valid as all of those other more clinical, I would say, um, goals that you might have um, in your ulcerative colitis journey. Yeah, I always think it's interesting when you see commercials for memory pills. I'm like, well, how do you remember to take the pill if you need a memory pill? But nevertheless... So one of the things I learned from my mentor 30 years ago was when he when when he brought me into the room to see patients, the first thing he said would say to them, and he still does, is, how can I help you? It's an interesting question because he doesn't go into the room and say, you have Crohn's, you have also flights, blah, blah, blah. He says, how can I help you? And kind of getting back to what you were referring to earlier and now again, too, is people have different priorities. So for example, um, people who are retired, they want to travel, okay? You get rid of the darn kids. Finally gotten through college, whatever, maybe off the, out of the house. Although I guess with COVID, they came back into the house. So maybe they want to travel before the kids come back into the house. But the point is they want to travel. So their priorities are different than the patient who comes in and says, I'm getting married in three months and I'm on steroids and I'm supposed to like fit in the dress and not have a face like this and have all the things like that too. Um, that person has a different priority or the couple that comes in and says, well, we wanna start a family, et cetera, et cetera, too. So, you know, it's almost like every time you open the door, there's a new patient experience in front of you too. And I really wanna encourage, as you've said, and others too, is, let your healthcare team know what, how can we help you? Because just saying, well, I have a little blood in my stool and you made it better. Well, that's not your concern. Your concern is that you're getting, you know, you're going on your honeymoon and you might want to, you know, not have bathroom issues on your honeymoon, or, you know, you're going to be, like you said, go, you're going to be going away to, to medical school. Did I mention she's going to Stanford Medical School? And then I didn't even get an interview there. Did I mention that? That you're going to, to medical school and that you may have to bring your medicines with you or an IV thing may not work out. Things like that. Uh, I think working together with your team is, is exceptionally important and you shouldn't be um, nervous to do that. Let your providers know what are your priorities. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's a, a great way to do that. So, so. Sorry, Russ, I'm going to interrupt. So Russ, I feel like just gave you guys some great advice on what to expect or what to talk about with your doctor to make sure that your priorities, your doctor knows what your priorities are. Amy, you've got about one and a half minutes to give the audience some adv what advice would you like to give both patients and providers in discussing 
um, your disease or your ulcerative colitis and, and symptoms like urgency and setting these treatment goals? What advice would you give? And I'm timing you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think when it comes to, I know we talked a lot about, okay, yes, just share your goals. But the question is, what are your goals and how do you figure that out? I think oftentimes, um, you know, there is this pressure that like, if my doctor sometimes will ask me like, Hey, Amy, how's it going? Like, how can I help you? All of a sudden my mind goes blank and I'm like, how can they help me? I don't know. Like, I haven't seen you for six months. Like so much has happened. Let me like think about it. And so to be honest, pre prepping for your appointment is something that is so invaluable. Um, it was something that I learned first how to do literally through my mom. She gave me, after I was diagnosed with colitis, she gave me this notebook and she was like, just write things down. And I was like, write what? Like, is this an assignment? She was like, no, this is just a notebook that you can carry around and anything you have, you know, a question or you think, oh, this might be a trigger food and you just want to jot something down do it. Here you go. Um, 14 years later, I still have that notebook. It's, it's almost at the end of its life, um, but you know, it's there, it's, it's, it's working for me. And that's what helps me for another patient. You know, you might be saying like, I don't want to carry around a notebook, uh, but you have a smartphone, maybe with the notes app that you could just, you know, type some things in if you'd like. Um, and I think that can be really useful that pre prep to say like, Hey, I'm feeling fine now, but three months ago, actually, I randomly had a, you know, um, a lot of urgency and pain and I was really worried about it, but I couldn't get into, you know, have an appointment or I forgot to message you on my health about it. Um, but I'm bringing it up now. What should I do in those cases? So those types of things, that way you're just, you know, prepared with your priorities and you yourself, you know, obviously are, are an expert on your own disease journey, but I recognize that sometimes when you have that very short amount of time with your clinician, it can be kind of, um, your brain can just get scrambled and you can forget. That's okay. Just write it down. So that way, when you come in, you can be better prepared and it doesn't have to be like an hour long brainstorming session. Just take five, 10 minutes as you're driving your way over, um, you know, to really just prepare for that. And that can go a long way in helping optimize your care. Any last 30 seconds, any last words for us? Yeah, I, I wanna thank everyone for watching. And I also wanna point out, don't stop your medicines because of the COVID infection. It's actually probably better for you to be on your IBD medicines during COVID than off of them other than steroids. Do not stop your medicines because of COVID. Please reach out to your medical team. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. I just, I wanna say a huge thank you to our speakers, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Russ Cohen, not the one on Twitter. And, and Amy, who was just amazing going to Stanford, Dr. Cohen did not get an interview, just in case you guys didn't get that. Um, if you have any other questions about tonight's program or need any assistance, obviously a huge resource is the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Their website's amazing. Their support groups are amazing. Their resources are amazing. It's Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. Um, you can also contact the IBD Help Center by calling 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN or emailing at infocronescolitisfoundation.org. To get information about everything we talked about in the clinician program, please visit medscape.org. Um, we have tons of resources for doctors. We have some resources for patients even associated with these programs. It's, it's good medical information that's quality valid and then if you're looking for patient resources we have webmd and you can always visit that although most doctors are not big fan <laughs> just kidding dr Cohen. i know you like webmd <laughs> um if you enjoyed this session and learned valuable information we do hope you'll share this recording please um it will be on available on the crohn's and colitis foundation facebook page and their YouTube channel. I believe it will also be available on the Medscape Facebook page. Um, with anyone you think would benefit from this, um, anyone battling IBD, anyone, you know, especially with ulcerative colitis, anyone dealing with urgency that might have these types of symptoms, um, really, really anyone, <laughs> all your friends and family effectively. We wanna to continue to serve the IBD community, both Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and Medscape with programs like this and other critical education support programs that our patients need now more than ever, especially 
with COVID and all kinds of random medical information out there. Um, thank you guys so much and take care. Have a great night and thanks for joining us.